Welcome, Siddharth Pradeep, to the Musicians Mobile Show. How you doing, hey. Matt? Doing well. Thanks for having me, Nate. You got it. Siddharth is one of our first groups of students. I consider him first generation. Um, <laughs> when we first started teaching home music lessons, uh, his, his, him and his brother were some of our very first students. And he started when he was eight. And now he's 24 years old. He's a third year medical student at UT Health San Antonio School of Medicine. He just passed his board exams, a lot of cool stuff going on in his life, uh, about to get married. And uh, it must feel like a huge sense of relief and accomplishment to have completed your board exams. How did knowing how to play guitar help you get through that journey? Yeah, um, I think, especially since I decided to take uh, to take on the career path of going into medicine and becoming a medical doctor, I I always knew it'd be difficult. But especially now, walking that walk, I recognize actually how much of an undertaking that was. And I think having guitar as kind of my anchor point and having that as the thing I used to de-stress at the end of every day has been absolutely essential. I, I don't think I would be sane if I didn't have my guitars and and my love for guitar. So at the end of the day, it must be really hard. You're coming home tired, you've studied, and you know, what, what do you do with your instrument? You use there certain songs, or how do you de-stress or you know, uh, relax with your instrument? Yeah, um, it's actually really interesting. Uh, I'm currently living in an apartment, and the interesting part of that is with an apartment, you have neighbors. And as a result, I haven't been able to play as much of the loud, like rock solo, even jazz soloing kind of guitar on, cause I have a really nice Fender tube amp, but you know, it's too loud. And I don't want to yeah. take chance of getting complaints. So I found myself, especially in the last two years since starting medical school, really drifting towards the acoustic more. And mm -hmm. as a gift, um, right after I finished my master's, my parents got me this beautiful, um, Martin acoustic. Oh, wow. Dreadnought, actually, yeah, and, yeah. It's a gorgeous uh, guitar, and so it really inspired me to get further into acoustic guitar. And kind of as a background, when I was an undergrad, I studied classical guitar with the guitar mm -hmm. department there as well. So I picked up a lot of classical guitar techniques, which are kind of transferable to even like modern uh, like acoustic guitar. Wow. And so I I find myself trying to find complicated and challenging songs in terms of technique for myself mm -hmm. that are in popular music. So I, uh, an example of that is um, in the last week, uh, right after I finished my board exam, my new project is to learn the song Never Going Back Again by Fleetwood Mac. Oh, like yeah. Super tough song, but it's, it's a really fun. Um, is that off Rumors? Really fun under huh? Is that off of yes, Rumors? I think it is. I think it is. Yeah. And actually, fun fact about Rumors I think when I was 12 years old, you gave me a bunch of albums that you wanted me to listen to, and that was one of them. Oh, Along yeah. You know they're from Palo Alto, right? I did not know that. That's really cool. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Stevie Nicks went to San Jose State for a little bit. No and way. <laughs> Lindsey Buckingham um, and Stevie Nicks, they had a group together first, mm -hmm. and then they later joined Fleetwood Mac, and they took, wow. it, they took it to that worldwide level with, with their songwriting and their... And their sound, yeah. Wow, I know, that's so cool. Yeah, Lindsey Buckingham is truly like, especially after really diving back into Fleetwood Mac after a long time, they, there's truly some genius level music on all oh, yeah. accounts. Songwriting, music, the instrumentation is just unbelievable. <laughs> Absolutely. You've been playing for, what is it, 16 years now? 16 years. No one has to try to motivate you to practice or enjoy playing music. How did you take ownership of your development and create and turn it into a creative out outlet that you truly are passionate about? Definitely. I think my music tastes um, inform that within myself, at least. So uh, even when I was 10 years old, I definitely had very unconventional music tastes for someone my age. I was yeah. listening to a lot of classic rock. I was listening to a lot of, I don't know, I just think music that my peers weren't necessarily listening to. And as I got yeah. older, even when I say older, I mean 15 in high school. So not right. old by any means, but older than 10. 
I was listening to progressive metal, progressive rock, and a lot of very complicated music from a music theory standpoint. And mm. I also started kind of meandering into jazz. And as a result, seeing the absolute breadth of music that's out there that isn't necessarily playing on the radio, it really piqued my interest. So for myself, I wanted to better understand these new types of music that I was discovering and that right. I found so interesting. And as a function of going and learning about those things and learning like, oh, like what types of modes are they using in this solo mm -hmm. or, you know, things like that, it made me introspect and think, hey, maybe I want to start incorporating some of this into my own playing for my own personal style. And that's kind of where the practice came from. It was kind of goal-oriented in a way because it was more of a, how can I incorporate these new tools into my physical point? Wow. Into, into a style rather than just taking bits and pieces of people and slamming them together. How can I really fuse it with how I play and how I approach the instrument? So that's kind of always, I think that's been pretty consistent for at least six or seven years in terms of my approach to the guitar, whether electric or acoustic. Now you said you started off with, um, or you had an early interest in classic rock. Mm -hmm. How were you exposed to classic rock or how did, you know, a lot of your friends sound like they were listening to maybe pop music or whatever was mm -hmm. on the radio. It seems like yeah. a pattern I've noticed emerge with some of our students who really excel is that they listen, their, their parents listen to classical rock or not classical rock, mm -hmm. classic rock, or they just have a lot of music going on in the house. As yeah. far as playing it or exposing their kids to music. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's actually really interesting because neither of my parents are particularly musical in right. terms of skill, but they love music. Right. And uh, my dad, he came to this country in the late 80s to um, finish his right. MBA. And during that time was really like, that was a golden age of music, you know, oh, in terms of times. And so he really immersed himself in the American culture through classic rock. That's how he found a way to assimilate into, the, into America itself. I, I've heard similar stories. Yeah. Yeah, but... Um, as a result, he really has quite an encyclopedic knowledge of classic rock and even the one hit wonder bands and all that. And so he shared all that with me at a very young age. And I just happened to take to it at that young age. And so I, that, I, I will also yeah. give you credit too. I think I really can give you credit, mate, for that oh, because thanks. at eight years old, at the same time, you're still a very malleable person, right? And I think you really showed me all of the di like the different ways to look at music as a player mm. and a listener. And oh. as a result, the, like the first few sets of songs and stuff like that, that I learned after we did basic, basic learning ended up being classic rock. And I think that combined with my father making me listen to that music that really made me want to play and listen to it. And then it informed all of my music tastes in the future. I think it's really cool that even though your dad, he didn't play an instrument, he was able to have a big influence on you and, mm -hmm. and just that excitement for music that mm -hmm. you were able to kind of, maybe, maybe your dad wanted to play an instrument. I don't know, mm -hmm. but yeah. vicariously through you, he's getting to see his, his, uh, his sons excel with, with music, which is really cool. In those early years, first year or two can be tough. What was the most challenging part of your growth and how did you overcome it those early years? Yeah, I think, I think, and I, and I can actually think of a specific example. I remember that Hal Leonard book with uh, yeah. the sheet music in it and like first learning how to read like treble clef and right. going and putting, putting the notes and putting that with context on the fretboard and where those notes are and things like that. That was really tricky because it was, kind of speaking a new language a little bit mm -hmm. and i think <laughs> to be honest i think the reason i was able to get through that especially at such a young age was at the insistence of my mother she made me practice that stuff for at least the beginning and only after a couple of years did i really start taking all of that on to, for myself and i definitely credit my mom with being tenacious yes. about getting me and uh, to practice and to keep playing and saying you know like this is the foundation you have to build. You can't have do the fun stuff that you're imagining unless you build the foundation. I absolutely, 100% agree with that. Absolutely. She was always encouraging you guys to get out and perform too. Yeah. Organizing uh, performance opportunities in the school, whether they be fundraisers, 
you guys are always applying your music to um, to doing good things in the community, which I thought was cool. Yeah. Was there ever a period in your playing when you weren't enjoying the process? And if so, what turned it around? I don't think music was ever not fun for me, but I definitely think <laughs> it was a struggle for me at a certain period. And I think that was kind of when I was around the age of 15, 16, when I kind of got, I had some faculty over the instrument at that point. I was relatively good at it. I could, I could learn songs that had been pre-made by another band relatively easily and recreate right. it on my instrument. But there wasn't much of my own flavor I really had yet. And right. I remember um, with one of your instructors who you had at the time, Colin Gailey, I was learning some music theory from him. And right. at, at, at like, I think 14 or 15, and it was so frustrating to me because I had gotten so set in my ways of just knowing the songs I knew and stuff like that. I'd never tried to improvise or use improvisation in anything. Right. And so to me, because learning songs came so easily, because I'd been doing it for four or five years at that point, right. I expected applying the music theory to my playing to be that easy of a transition as well. And it right. was not because mm. I mean, it's a matter of, thinking about note choices, thinking about what the chord progression is, and then can your left and right hand even do it? You know, right. <laughs> it's gotta be all those moving parts together. Yeah. So I, it was frustrating for sure. And, but I mean, after that initial slog and, and kind of getting the right and left hand together and then coordinating that with what I'm thinking in my head, mm -hmm. I think it was, it was so worth it because now I look at my style of playing and I think, if somebody was listening to me play, I don't, it doesn't sound like I'm imitating anyone. And my improvisation is, I think very much indicative of me. And if someone were to listen to me multiple, multiple times, I think you could pick out if I was playing a certain groove or melody or something, just because of the, the habits that I have because of right. all those things that I put together. I think that's a really um, amazing thing when you can develop your own style you're not, you're not just playing music off the page anymore. You're now developing, you have an artistic uh, expression of, of who you are with music now, which, you know, there's certain levels to this. There's first just learning how to hold the instrument and learning some notes. And then there's learning to play songs and there's learning to play, making the songs your own or putting your own spin on them. And then there's developing your own style. That, I mean, that is a really high level to get to that, um, that you know, it, it's a fun aspiration to shoot towards. You can discover mm -hmm. yourself through music. What would you tell a newbie who's just starting out and they're making a ton of mistakes on their instrument and they're starting to doubt themselves like, hey, I don't know if I'm really good at this. I'm making all these mistakes and it seems so easy. Look at Siddhar. He, you can jam the guitar. <laughs> what would you tell that newbie? Yeah, well, I would say, you know, it's, it's going to be hard in the first few years because at the end of the day, if you think of any sport, any activity that a person can excel at, there's, there's a guy named Malcolm Gladwell who wrote some un oh, yeah. unbelievable books, and he has this amazing quote where it is, you will, you will become a master of something only after you put in 10,000 hours of practice. Right. And I think that is one of the most apt, uh, one of the most apt things to live by in anything. And especially with your instrument, you need to get those reps in those 10,000 hours. And even if that's just yes. a metaphor, that 10,000 hours, not a literal 10,000 hours, the sentiment is absolutely a sound one that, that if you just grind it out and put that practice in the output will be there because it's really hard to build technique on your, on your left hand. At the end of the day, these are muscles. They have to be trained. You can't train muscles in a day, you know? Yeah. And at the same time, your brain connecting with your hands, those are habits that you have to build. And so building those habits takes time and absolutely it's going to suck in the beginning, but just, yeah. I think YouTube is actually an amazing inspiration for new players these days because they have a uh, lot of guys who now do the like, thousand day transformation where it shows like a person mm. on day one of picking up the guitar and they will document over like four or five years, their progress. So you can see that it is a longer undertaking, but right. the, the, 
outcome is there if you put the time. Absolutely. You know, he said 10,000 hours, but if you think about it, 10,000 hours could take 10,000 years. Yes. You're only practicing an hour a year. <laughs> so yeah, that's true. <laughs> that, and that's to become a master. Yeah. To be, not, not everyone wants to become a master of, of the instrument. Some want to get really good and play songs for their friends. So, you know, 2000 hours or maybe a thousand hours, you might be hitting some of your, your goals. If you're, you know, your goal is not absolutely to maybe even less than that. Yeah. I've heard in the first 20 hours, there's, there's some interesting, uh, I forget who the speaker was. The first 20 hours you put in, you can, you can accomplish some huge feats on any kind of endeavor or instrument, um, with deliberate practice. Another good point that you brought up is it's the reps. I think mm -hmm. a lot of, uh, new students can underestimate how many reps you are putting in to get good at a song. Right? Can you speak to that? How many reps does it take? How long are you practicing a solo or just a little phrase to get good? Yeah. At? No, I mean, and, and especially like when you're in that beginner to intermediate stage, it's just, it's, it's the only time you're going to get really quick on the uptake on songs, whether it's learning a song, learning a scale, or learning anything is when you're very far into it. Once you're reaching that, ex, that, that expert slash master stage of that skill. And right. so putting that into context, like it will take dedication. And I think a really good, just an arbitrary set thing is, you know, 30 minutes to an hour a day on that. Mm -hmm. And that gives structure. And I definitely used that type of approach when I was an undergrad learning classical guitar. Because classical guitar was a complete other beast. And it... Right was so hard. And in terms of your right hand or left hand, depending on what handedness, but in your finger, your strings hand. Oh my gosh. Like the amount of practice I would have to do for some of those picking patterns, I would have to sit mute my strings and for 30 minutes straight, just sit and repeat that pattern in my hand. Wow. And that's the kind of reps. Talk that's about repetitions. Kind of yeah. But I mean, by the end of undergrad, um, I, I think I can confidently say, and without bragging, I was pretty phenomenal at classical guitar because I put the time in. I practiced almost you two hours it. a day. It was two you hours you every earned day. It. Yeah, I, I think so. And it was funny because my best friend and I both studied classical guitar at that same classical guitar department. And we, not, we were both science majors. We were both studying molecular biology. And, right. and they had dedicated music majors. And our guitar professor came to us at the end of our four years of undergrad, right before he graduated, and told us, you two were my best students from a standpoint of dedication and skill. Like, he thought we were more skilled than the actual guitar majors themselves. Wow. And I think that really reflected, and it was validation for us, because I know how much time we put in. We would sit in those practice rooms in the on Saturday, on like a Saturday afternoon and just right. practice for three hours and really practice, not just play what we want. We would bring our sheet music out and learn our etudes and stuff. And I mean, it, it was just, it was validated. And I think that's actually a great example of how you put those reps in, you will get the result. You will. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people who, who might think, well, Siddharth, he's a natural. No, no. And discount the work. <laughs> Like, you, did you just start off as this natural, naturally great musician when you were eight years old? Heck no. Oh my God. And, and I think that's actually a really interesting point you bring up because especially starting an undergrad, along with the fact that I did classical guitar, I started singing. I'd never really sung at any point in my life. I had no okay. training. I never had interest in singing. And I decided, you know, maybe like I should start singing a little bit. And I joined the school's acapella group and one of the acapella group members was a vocal performance major at school. Right. And on the weekends, <clears throat> along with my guitar practice, I would get this friend would come and teach me how to sing, like vocal, like properly use my diary mm -hmm. and stuff like that in vocals to the point where now I'm the head. Well, in the last two years, I was the head of my med school acapella group. Wow. I didn't and even know so, there was a med school acapella group. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. But the point being is like, to point shot, I'm not a natural in anything that I do. In fact, I, I could maybe match pitch when I started singing. That's the right. extent of my skill. And with those reps I put in, sitting and practicing, how to control my larynx, how to control my diaphragm, all these like very 
specific things and the time I put in to honing those skills, the result is there now. Now I think that singing is probably one of my strengths. I think I could comfortably go learn a song to sing and play guitar. And I think it's a strength rather than just another thing I can do. How, how is that broader theory of getting your reps in that you've developed through music applied to other areas of your life? Yeah. Um, I think a perfectly and perfect and timely example of that is this board exam I just took. Um, it's possibly one of the biggest tests I'll ever ever take in my life because this score determines the type of specialty that I'm competitive to apply to. So it's a very career defining test that I just took. And I started studying in February and the understanding is this is such a large test because it's over almost the entire content of medicine like of basic medicine, obviously not procedural medicine in the hospital, but in terms of the theory behind medicine and how all these organ systems work together and pathology and all that, it is everything, pharmacology, pathology, organ systems of every organ in your body. So basically anything about anything in your body was fair game on this exam. And I studied for eight to 10 hours a day for three months straight every day. Wow. The amount of- There was nothing else. And patience that must go into that. It was, and it was reps. It was reps. It's, am I going to sit every day and do my readings, brush up on my knowledge with the schedule I've made myself? Am I going to sit and do my practice questions every day? And it's those reps over time. Did you, reps over did you time. break it down? Kind of like a, you know, you, when you learn a song, you have maybe, I don't know, 60 measures or whatever, but you have to break yeah. it down into little sections and little bites and perform, you know, was there, is there a metaphor there where you almost broke this, oh, this yeah. study down like you would break down a song and then, you know, reverse Absolutely. engineer it? Oh, hundred percent. I, I mean, the only way I was able to stay relatively sane and even be able to complete this studying was to make a relatively detailed schedule for myself for at, accounting for every day. So yeah. And I would sit and write out like this day, I'm going to look at this topic. The next day I'm going to assess myself with that topic and so on and so forth for three months. Like, wow. and I mapped it out for myself and it's very much how I'd map out a song. In fact, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I mentioned earlier that I'm learning this new song, never going back again by Fleetwood Mac right now. And it's really right. difficult. There's like, a really interesting Travis picking bit going on with a thumb and it's playing like this, this running bass line, And it's like a polyrhythm with the bottom half of your right hand because you're right. playing different patterns. And, right. and my approach to that too is completely segmental. It's in the beginning, before I even started trying to learn the chords, I first figured out the patterns on the thumb, figured out the mm -hmm. patterns in these three fingers, and then I even see. tried to put them together. I see. And then so next you do, then, you do and the, the right hand first. Like, yeah. Yeah. I did right hand first because the pattern is super hard. And then I went for the chord hand after that. Cause I think chords are definitely something that come quite easily to me now because of classical guitar and all that stuff. So, and the chords in the song aren't particularly difficult. It's all right hand. That is the challenge of the song. So, but like that segmental approach I think is really helping because in three days I've already got it down to 50% speed and I mm -hmm. am very bad with, polyrhythms honestly and because rhythmically if something's not four four for me i have a very hard time yeah you know, doing if i'm doing it both with the same instrument or whatever yeah that that's incredible to um to be able to break these songs down you have an approach sounds like you have a game plan or approach whether it be <laughs> learning a song or your studies you yeah you go in there and you and you have a goal and you have a way that you're you're, you're thinking about before you dive into it how am I going to approach this? Absolutely. Yeah. What was one of your dream goals in your playing that seemed way beyond your capabilities yet you accomplished it? This is actually a really specific one. So I remember too, when I was younger, I, I never even thought about improvisation as a thing. And I knew it was never something I cared about. Something I did care about was the solo from comfortably numb by Pink. Oh Ball. yeah. I remember hearing that. That was this thing. When I first heard this solo, it almost made me cry. I was just like, oh, I love it. Yeah. I love that. It's so intentioned. I mean, David Gilmore's note choices are just legendary. Even to this day, I've listened to so much music. I don't think there's favorites. anything that can still move me like that. And I was, but I heard it and I was like, 
wow, this, this sounds pretty hard. And in terms of the way he's articulating notes, not just the speed, it's relatively fast solo too, but in the way he's articulating and sitting on some of those notes to give you that, to evoke that emotion out of you. Right. I, I remember hearing him being like, wow, I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to play this. And I eventually learned it. And I think I'm at a point now where I can, not only can I, do I think I can serviceably at least play that solo, I can add my own improvisational bits to mm. it and keep the integrity of the song. Like I think I know right. enough of the melodic components of the way David Gilmore plays that solo to where I can incorporate them into my own version. So you still know it's comfortably known solo, but right. it's my own version. Of it. And I think that's a really special thing for me to see now. And it's actually, when I practice electric guitar, I will do that. I will play that every single time I play it because not only is it great just practice because it is a relatively physically demanding solo as well. It's, it's a reminder to myself of where I am in the guitar, what I've achieved on that. Instrument. Mm, that's a good point because I imagine you keep stretching yourself and, and pushing to new uh, territories, which at times, you know, it, when you're challenging yourself, it could be tough. And sometimes you need to look back at those milestones and be like, look at this one I can already do. And it gives you mm -hmm. uh, an extra confidence boost to, to have those um, points that you can reflect on that, that show how, how far you've come along with your instrument. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's what will keep you motivated moving forward. The, going back to the point you were saying, you know, to the newbies who are still struggling and maybe making mistakes, just think about when you do put those reps in and you achieve that thing that's only a dream right now, how that's going to feel and how motivating that's going to be. Because that means you did achieve that seemingly insurmountable thing. Right. And now you can go towards the next leap. And, right. you know, sky's the limit at that point. Was there ever an inflection point in your playing where your development started to rapidly accelerate? Yeah, I think so. I think... I think it was when I was around 16 years old, right after I'd figured out how to add improvisation to my playing. I mean, it opened up a whole new world for me because then yeah. I could have fun playing anything at any time without having to rehearse and practice it. Like even being able to put on a record, whatever the record is, and just solo over it myself was the most satisfying thing on the planet. And obviously practicing incorporating music theory and modes and stuff into my playing through action rather than just learning it on a screen, like actually sitting and playing it really kind of fleshed it all together for me. And I think that point was very much, that was a very catalytic point for me because from then my, not only did my interest significantly skyrocket in learning music theory and really just practicing in general, my skill also itself increased. Right. I love what I was willing to put that time with the new motivation. One of the things we're trying to do at Musicians Mobile now more than ever is to help our students learn to jam and improvise. But I think it's kind of hard for us to explain it sometimes to parents or new students who, who don't maybe understand the value of that or why, you know, they're used to their kids just learning songs, but not necessarily either creating them or improvising along the songs. What would you say are some of the the biggest benefits or why should kids learn to improvise, you know, by either, yeah, learn to improvise or write their own songs. Why should they get more involved in the creative aspect, their own originality yeah. with music? I think one thing I realized for myself is once I was able to do that, I went from being a music player to being a musician. Uh -huh. Because to me, at least this is my personal def definition of that. Uh -huh is that if I can have some level of ownership over what I'm playing, if something I'm doing is unique to myself and it's reflecting right. my expression, my internal emotions and expression, then I just created something special. And right. that's something to be proud of every time you do it. You can be proud of if you play some improvisation over another song and it's really cool and you re you're like, wow, that was really cool what I just did. Right. You did that. It was right. something that you came up with it was something that you can take ownership of. And at the lowest level, it really can give a sense of pride to oneself and, and confidence. And I think confidence, not just as a musician, but as a person, because I think it's such a unique skill that a lot of people may not have these days to have such improvisational music, musical skills that when you do have it, I think even for one's own confidence, like I right. can speak to this for myself, it was a game changer for me. Yeah. It must be cathartic too in, in healing to be able to 
have a way to express yourself with your own notes. Oh you know? yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, it's so interesting because I'm a man of science now, you know, I'm going to be a medical doctor and everything I'm going to be dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis is going to be around human mortality and science. Those are, it's, it's a very tangible, tangible and informations based career. But at the same time, I find myself this interesting duality where not, not only is that one half of me, but there's also a very abstract side of me that maybe there aren't words I can use to express. But for some reason, with the toolbox I now have in terms of my music theory and my own my physical skills on the guitar, I can express those things on that instrument. And I don't know how to explain it. Like I genuinely don't have words to explain how that feels other than I feel heard. What and, and it doesn't there doesn't have to be anyone listening to me and I still feel heard. I feel like the world is hearing me. At some level, those right. sound waves coming from my amp or guitar are reverberating through the literal world, the literal space we're in. So at some level, the world is listening to me and that is enough for me. And it really, it's a significant experience for me, especially since starting medical school, like dealing with the death that I have seen right. um, in the hospital and stuff like that on my internships has been really difficult because no one is built for that going into this. You know, no one is ready for that. You just recognize it's going to be a hard thing to deal with when you have to deal with it, but you don't, you're not ready for it. And so I think music really helped me contextualize a lot of those feelings for myself and helped me cope because it's, it's hard for any human seeing another human suffer and die or not die. And music has been integral to me in that way too, in a very abstract sense. It sounds like it's almost like a spiritual connection. Yeah, absolutely. I, my instruments are an extension of me. They really are. I think that's one of the highest forms you can get to in playing an instrument when it is an extension of who you are. Mm -hmm. What's one of your favorite performance memories uh, playing with others? I think my first favorite performance memory was at, I think Britannia Arms Pub was the name. Yeah. We played, I played Carry On My Wayward Son. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah that's a tough one and that and that was fun because that was the first truly challenging song that i'd ever learned right and and everybody that i was playing with including the other students i played with everyone killed it so it just it sounded really good and it was cool to have at that age validity that i could play something relatively difficult and that i had the skill right. to do it i think my, Perform my live too in front of an audience and yeah 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 something you did with others and is a, is a group group project mm -hmm. definitely and i think my second favorite performance was actually it was last year it was last spring mm. and um our medical school holds a fundraiser every year in the spring at a local coffee shop where all the proceeds of everything bought by students or faculty or anyone who comes through goes towards this fund to buy medications for our medical school group that goes to Ethiopia and wow. performs, yeah, and performs like preventative and primary care for three weeks in a really small village in a remote area in Ethiopia. And all, so, and so as a result, they made it kind of an event at this coffee shop in the evening where it was kind of like a performance with set lists. And myself and one of my classmates were like the headlining act at it. Yeah. And it was really interesting because it was a relatively small space, the, the size of a normal coffee shop, but there were 200 people there, packed like sardines in there. And all we had, uh, and, and it was an acoustic set in that I only had my acoustic guitar, there were mics, and I had my acoustic electric plugged into a PA, but it was just my playing. It was just amplified. It wasn't, there was no pedals, nothing. Mm. and we played and sang me and me and my classmate we played and sang a few songs where it was a lot of like, like kind of folky type music but pretty difficult guitar and a lot of difficult vocal harmonies that we were both singing with each other that was just it was a really big step for me because i know i have faculty over the guitar itself and i know i can sing i know i can do those things separately but being able to put right. those two together and succeed at it in a setting where there's some pressure, you know, like people oh, yeah. are expecting this to be good. They paid $10 to come to this event, whether or not it's for charity, they still paid $10 to come right. hang out and watch this music. And, and not being a professional musician, it was a big deal to me because 
it, it proved to me that I'm on that threshold. Like if I were to want to, I feel like I have enough skill where I could take it to the next step, next level. I could practice extra and I could like at least try my hand at being a gig musician. And that's enough of a validation for me that the time I put into it, the practice I put into it is really worth it for multiple ends, not only for myself, but other people enjoying my music as well. You, you, you could definitely be, I mean, you're a professional musician, even though you may not be getting paid at it. You go out there and, <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know about Come that. on, Siddhar. <laughs> Our vision at Musicians Mobile is using music as an instrument for joy, connection, and growth. And uh, you really funny. ran with that idea. Can you speak to how you've harnessed your skill as a musician to connect with others? I think it's a whole nother beast playing for other people because as good as you can be playing for yourself and improvising and doing all these things, learning songs, et cetera, playing for other people adds another level of, I don't know, another level of difficulty only from the sense that there's nerves that come in. But along with nerves, it's you understand as a musician what you accomplish with yourself when you play a song, but you want to, be able to have people have a similar interpretation or at least have a positive interpretation of whatever it is that you're playing. So I think there's a very interesting, there's a very interesting thing there that you can really only practice by playing for other people. Mm. And I think um, me being in a band in high school, broken reins with some classmates and playing relatively frequently, playing a show a week almost right. was a really good practice for that. Because in the beginning I definitely was, nervous all the time and when we'd go and play and towards the end of our um, tenure before everyone split ways and went to college I relished those times when we get to practice, uh, go and perform I enjoyed going and playing for people at bars and, and right. restaurants and stuff like that and I think it's a really special thing to be able to share that with people I think it goes back to, to speaking to your getting reps in you were getting reps in performing mm -hmm. Yep. I play back to reps. Is. Back to the reps once a week. Speaking of broken reins, um, how did you use or utilize your band to help others in their time of need through your band, Broken Reins? Yeah. There were a lot of unique opportunities we had there. And I think there were two things I can think of specifically. So, our high school dance team at Lake Travis High School, they were holding a fundraiser for um, a, ch a local charity. And they were holding this fundraiser event. And we decided instead of like, cause at this point playing at bars and stuff, even though we were in high school, we were getting paid a pretty decent amount, you know, $300. Per day. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe at that time, but I mean, we were getting paid a decent amount of money to go and play these sets of music. And so, I mean, we could have reasonably just been like abandoned and said, Hey, pay us for this. But we were like, you know what? If we go and perform this show and just, perform this show for them, don't ask for anything in return, this money can completely go towards charity. And so we did that. And it was really cool opportunity to be able to play our music and know that the outputs of that music were directly going to people in need. That was awesome. That's incredible. Yeah. Well, great job, man. It's, it's so inspiring. You know, the reason why we're doing this is to show this next generation of students who are coming up through Musicians Mobile and even outside of Musicians Mobile, it's a journey and it's a lifelong mm -hmm. journey. It's a fun journey. It can be exciting. It can take you on many different paths. And, you know, you guys, you and your brother and, and some of our first generation students have done so many cool things. Um, and it, it's really inspiring just to see what you guys have done with music. And I imagine you're going to continue playing music for the rest of your life. hundred percent. At this point, no one needs to motivate you to practice. Mm -hmm. you, you just naturally gravitate toward it. And it seems it's just gratifying to see as a teacher, man, you've come a long way since Spanish theme. Remember learning? Yeah, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Spanish. I, I haven't thought Spanish about that in 15 years. Man. Spanish so theme, relative to, to how good you were then Spanish yeah. theme must've been incredibly hard. It's oh, just yeah. a simple song with three notes. I had to practice so much. I remember. I remember practicing for that because I didn't want to. My mom would make me. 
<laughs> yep. Well, good wow. job, Siddharth. Congrats on uh, all your great things happening in your life. I'm happy to see you're getting married and excelling in school. And, and thanks so much, man. Stay in touch. Can't wait to the, for the next time to visit your family and everything. And thanks for your family's positive influence in my life. You guys have also been incredibly uh, impactful in my life. So Thank thanks so much. Man. Yeah, of course. Have no, a good I'm one. So glad to be in your side. Bye-bye. All right. Peace. All right. Bye-bye.